subject. 1.7 is about periodic trends. In 1.5, we talked about ionization energy. We have a couple more trends that we're going to throw in to the hat. Uh, some of them we covered in Chemistry 1, um, but it's all helping us to understand the atom better. So the periodic table that we have today contains a tremendous amount of useful information. Not only does it tell us like trends, but it also tells us patterns in like elements and their chemical properties. So um, the very first person to come up with our modern periodic table was Dmitry Mendeleev. Um, and also kind of simultaneously, it, was, it came up from Julius Mother Meyer, but Mendeleev kind of gets all the credit. So um, Mendeleev is given credit because he was able to predict elements that we hadn't discovered yet um, from his, and Meyer did not, so that's why Mendeleev's given more credit. Um, and Mendeleev, some of the elements he predicted were gallium, scandium, and germanium, all of which were still unknown at the time when he decided to come up with it. Well, I mean, he came up with it because he was a science teacher and his students couldn't remember the elements. So he tried to come up with a good way to help them remember. Um, so this is an example of what his original table looked like. Uh, if you see how the highlighted version of them, or the highlighted ones, are the unknowns that he predicted um, throughout it. So uh, I actually, I didn't read the article, but I saw an article yesterday posted on a chemistry teacher forum about, like, let's get rid of Mendeleev's table. There's something better now, but I'll have to read that and get back to you and see what that's about. Maybe in five years we won't use the periodic table anymore. I'll have to buy some new shoes. So just as seen as 1.5, ionization energy is one of the trends that we can see from the periodic table based on the placement. Um, in case you need to see this, and this is just a generalization, but I've said this before, fluorine is the highest for ionization energy, and the lowest would be francium. So as you go farther right on the periodic table, it gets higher. As you go up a column, ionization energy gets higher. Okay. Other trends that we're going to talk about are electron affinity, atomic and ionic radii, and electronegativity. Electron affinity is actually new this year to the AP exam, um, but it's not a new trend. It's been around. It's just newly tested. Um, this is the energy change associated with the addition of electrons. So ionization energy is trying to pull electrons away. Electron affinity is how much energy, you get, energy do you get when you gain an electron. Since you're gaining electrons, which have negative charge, then the value of the energy would be a negative sign for that negative charge um, to correspond with that. This picture is found in your textbook on page 333, um, and it shows atoms among the first 20 elements that form stable isolated negative ions, which if you look at the y-axis, it's only a negative value for the electron affinity. Um, so, and it doesn't even show all the elements, okay? The lines connecting them represent uh, adjacent on the periodic table elements. If they don't have a line in between them, that's because there are gaps. And the gaps are from elements that don't form stable negative ions. So they're not stable if they gain an electron, so they would not have a stable value, okay? Like the ones that are missing from this because it's the first 20 elements is helium. There's a gap in between hydrogen and lithium. Then also beryllium, nitrogen, neon, magnesium, and argon. So uh, the group 2A, the alkaline earth metals, are not there except for calcium. Um, and the noble gases are not there. Um, and then like nitrogen is kind of likes a negative three, but it doesn't like negative one. So um, this is just trying to help you see that they have negative values <laughs> if they are favorable, if they will gain those electrons and be stable. Okay, as you go down a group on the periodic table, the electron affinity should become more positive, meaning less energy is released. So 
This is because the electron is added at increasing distances from the nucleus, meaning it takes less energy to do so. Um, when it's farther from the nucleus, you need less energy to combat those protons. Okay? There are exceptions to this rule, but most of them will not be tested on the AP exam. So, for example, I have this table here, and this is the, the affinities for the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Now, fluorine is negative 327.8 kilojoules per mole, chlorine is negative 348.7, bromine is negative 324.5, and iodine is negative 295.2. So, chlorine, bromine, and iodine all follow the trend where as you go down a group, it becomes less negative, more positive. The exception to this group is fluorine. And the reason why fluorine is an exception is because fluorine is in the 2p sublevel, where all of its valence electrons are. Chlorine is in 3p, and then 4p, and then 5p, okay? So since 2p is a lot smaller size than 3p or 4p or 5p, that makes it easier for the electrons to repulse each other, so it makes it need less energy to, to combat that, okay? So this, like that in general, you wouldn't have to know specifically about fluorine like that, but that would be an exception that we want to be tested on. But in general, the trend goes as you go down the table, or down the periodic table, it will become more positive, okay? The next trend is called the atomic radius trend. You, we did mention this in Chem 1. The definition of atomic radius is it's half the different distance between the nuclei and a molecule consisting of identical atoms. Okay, so here's a picture to try and show you that. Um, in general, and we, we learned it this way in Chem 1, and I have all this written on the next slide, but I want to refer back to this picture, okay? Um, if, if you see, going from left to right across the period, it gets smaller, okay? Um, so as you go from left to right, the atomic radius gets smaller. As you go from top to bottom, the atomic radius gets larger, okay? The reason why that is because the way that it is, is when you have the decrease from left to right, you are increasing the nuclear charge because as you go left to right, you're increasing protons, okay? So as you increase protons, you get more protons, so they're stronger to pull in the electron, making the size of the atom get smaller. But as you go down a column, you still have the same number of valence electrons, but the nucleus is also getting bigger. Um, so, what am I trying to say here? Sorry, I was so good this morning at like seven o'clock when I read over this. Um, okay, oh sorry, this is all just going left to right. Okay, so the valence electrons are drawn close to the nucleus as you go left to right as well, decreasing the size because of that nuclear charge being higher, okay? It increases as you go down a group, I was jumping ahead of myself, because the orbital size increases because of the principal quantum numbers, or principal quantum levels, or the energy levels. So as you just in general get more electrons, the atom has to be bigger to take care of all of those electrons. Because hydrogen only has one proton and one electron, compared to cesium has 55 protons and 55 electrons. Just having more subatomic particles makes a bigger element, a bigger atom, okay? Uh, now, uh, we're gonna talk about this in a little second, in a bit, but ion size is opposite of that. So when you are adding and subtracting electrons, that changes the size of things. So we'll see that in a second, okay? Electronegativity is the last trend for now. Um, this is the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself. So ionization energy is to lose electrons, but electronegativity kind of goes along with electron affinity, where you want to attract electrons to itself. So Linus Paulding developed a widely accepted method, and he has values of this. This uh, table is found in your textbook on page 357. Um, you will need this when you do problems using electronegativity. Um, but, and this is also in your textbook, but 
you might want to write some stuff down. So as the electronegativity difference changes, that changes the bond type. So I think it's number 35 on the homework that um, you have to predict if it's ionic, polar, covalent, or just nonpolar covalent. And it, I should have put it for 1.7 homework, not for 1.5 homework. Um, that was my mistake, but this is what it's about, okay? So when you, um, when it's talking about zero and it's covalent, our textbook says it's just covalent, but this is really nonpolar covalent. We use the words polar and nonpolar in Chem 1, and I like to put nonpolar in front of it. We're going to put polar in front of it. Um, the larger the difference, the more likely it will be ionic. The smaller the difference, the more likely it will be nonpolar. Okay? And you, to find those differences, you subtract the values from this table. Okay? So when you subtract the values, um, if it's between 0 and 1.5, it's definitely going to be nonpolar, covalent, okay? If it is between 0.5 and 1.6, it's going to be polar covalent. I'm going to put polar co for covalent. Now, 1.6, between 1.6 and 2.0, that one, it depends if it contains a metal or not. Uh, if it has a metal, then it will be ionic. If it doesn't have a metal, so if no metal, then that would mean that it is polar covalent. Because that is in between, that 1.62 range is in between. And then if it's above 2, so 2.0 plus, that would be ionic. Okay, so you can subtract numbers from that table and then um, from those values, you could predict if it's polar covalent, non-polar covalent, ionic, like that. So that will really help number 35 on the homework for all of you who are doing homework every night like you're supposed to. I know two people because they've asked me. Um, so in our example, which the number is wrong, but it's supposed to be example 17. Sorry, go back. Okay. So in the textbook, there's pictures of what, like, the nonpolar and the polar and the movement of electrons looks like, um, some models of that, but uh, it has to do with those electrons sharing, covalent, remember, is sharing, ionic is transferring electrons, um, so it all has to do with that. So um, we have one more slide and then we'll have our example and we still have like another page and a half to go. Okay, so for identical atoms, the electrons and the bonds are shared equally and no polarity develops, that's why we say it's nonpolar. When two atoms with very different electronegativities interact, the electron transfer could make it ionic. Um, but if they're kind of in the middle, then it would be a polar covalent instant. So um, it would be unequal but still sharing if it's polar covalent. It's only transferring if it's ionic. Okay, so like think about the tug of rope in between. Both atoms are sharing the electrons when it's covalent. Um, it just means that one side of the atoms in between the bonds would like the electrons more when it's Okay, so in your notes this says example one, but it's wrong. It's actually example 17. Sorry for the typo. What we're going to do is we are going to order the bonds according to polarity. So the reason why you have in the textbook page 357 out is because we are going to use the values for each of the elements to do the subtraction, and then based on the value from that range that I told you that like zero to 0.5 is nonpolar covalent, 0.5 to 1.6 is polar covalent. Once we know the value after subtracting, that will tell us the type of bond it is, okay? Because we want to order these in increasing polarity order. Okay, so looking at that table, what's the value, so we have hydrogen, so what's hydrogen's number? 2.1. 2.1, okay. What is oxygen? 
I would suggest writing these down just in case you forget where these numbers come from. Maybe also put like on page 357. Okay, chlorine. 3.0. Sulfur. 3.5. 2.5, think. 2, that's a 2. And F, 4.0, okay. Because remember, this has to do with electronegativity and fluorine is the most electronegative. Okay, so now, um, you always take bigger minus smaller when you subtract. So for the HH bond, I'm not gonna show the work every time, but I will for the first couple. We would take the hydrogen value minus the hydrogen value. So 2.1 minus 2.1 equals zero. So do you think that's nonpolar or polar? Non that's a nonpolar covalent. Okay. The next one, we have the OH bond. So we would take 3.5 minus 2.1. What's that? 1.4. Okay. Then the CLH bond. So that's polar? Um, <coughs> yes, that would be a polar covalent. Yes. So I'm not going to write all that down because we just have to order according to polarity. So we don't have to necessarily label that on number 35 in the homework that should have been assigned for this section. You do need to label that, so you might want to use these for that. Um, but what about, what's the answer for the CLH bond? 0 0.9. Okay. The sulfur hydrogen bond? 0 0.4. And the FH bond, 1.9. Okay, so using these numbers, this will help us list from least polar to most polar, okay? Um, I don't really have space left. So, I'm gonna clear this in a second, but does anybody still need it up before I clear? We're all good? Okay. So, uh, I'm going to go least polar on the left. I'm going to go most polar on the right. Okay? So, what is the least polar out of all of the bonds? The HH bond. The green one. Okay. What would you put next? What? The sulfur hydrogen. Then the chlorine hydrogen and the oxygen hydrogen and last but not least the chlorine okay so this is the answer to the problem because we have found from those values that I had to erase this is how you could do that now if you didn't if you weren't given values like maybe on the AP exam you have a multiple choice question and it just says which of the following bonds is the most polar and you have no numerical data and you don't have a calculator to figure it out. Remember the trend, fluorine is the largest and the farther away they are from each other on the periodic table, the more likely it is to be polar, okay? So you could guess that the fluorine hydrogen, hydrogen bond would be the most polar because fluorine and hydrogen are geographically on the periodic table the farthest away. Okay, make sense? Hopefully, great. Moving on. We talked about before atomic radius for a trend. Well, um, we have to also talk about how do ion sizes compare to that, okay? So given for the representative elements, which are groups 1A through 7A, or A, A, if you want to include there, remember that um, the charge comes from their electron configuration what they want to lose to have the stable configuration of a noble gas. We can generalize and say that 1A is plus 1, 2A is plus 2, 7A is minus 1. Common knowledge, we know that, right? Okay. Um, so, this is an example of an ionic bond where the sodium has one valence electron, right? It's in a, it ends in S1. So, that is the electron that is given over to chlorine, and that's where chlorine gains that one electron to have a stable octet to be like a noble gas. 
So um, when we're transferring those electrons, that changes the size of the ions now when they're no longer atoms. If you're losing an electron, do you think it gets bigger or smaller? It's going to get smaller. Because if you're losing an electron, it's going to get smaller. And if you're gaining an electron, it will get bigger, right? OK. So when two nonmetals react to form a covalent bond, they share electrons in a way that complete, com completes the valence electron configurations of both atoms, just like we have known before. That means that both nonmetals will attain noble gas status of having a total of valence electrons. It won't be the same as transferring like it is with an ion. When a nonmetal and a representative group metal react to find to form ionic compounds, the metal loses the electron like we saw to be like the noble gas behind it, and the nonmetal will gain to be like the next noble gas on the periodic table. So basically, make sure you're able to identify the charges. Um, if you have this memorized, great. If not, Memorize it based on why it is actually the way it is. I don't know. Um, but these are just the column charges. Remember that um, the noble gases are what everybody's changing their electrons to be like when they gain and lose electrons, but they don't actually gain and lose themselves. The ion size plays an important role in determining the structure and stability of ionic solids, the properties of them, and the biologic effects of ions. So just like atoms, the ionic radii are impossible to define precisely, but we can have trends. Like we kind of guessed, when we have a positive ion, the cation is smaller than its parent atom. So what it originally was as an atom, it gets smaller. So I have pictured here lithium with three electrons. Um, and then that turns into lithium ion with only two electrons. So by losing that electron from the outermost shell, it would have a greater pull for the nucleus, so the nucleus would pull in those electrons even more, okay? And making it smaller. So then the negative is true for anions where it would get slightly larger than its parent atom because you are gaining an additional electron, so it's overcoming that nuclear charge so that it can expand a little bit bigger. And I have a picture of chlorine. Okay, so as the trend goes, as you move down a group, so down a column, the size will increase. That has to do with just getting more protons and electrons in the total atom or ion than anything else. Um, but the horizontal change is difficult because it's hard to compare metals versus nonmetals. Nonmetals will tend to always be bigger as an ion than metals are, because metals are the ones that lose electrons, and ions are the ones that gain electrons, okay? So if you ever see a picture, and it's hard to determine which is the cation and which is the anion, just always remember the cation is smaller, okay? Um, with making ions, or having ions form, we have things that are called isoelectronic ions. This means that they have the same number of electrons, isoelectronic same number of electrons. Same number of electrons. Okay, isoelectronic. So, when I have all these listed, so we have oxygen with a negative two, oxide ion, fluoride ion, sodium ion, and magnesium ion, and aluminum ion. Does anybody want to take a guess what noble gas they all have the same number of electrons as? Like if sodium loses one electron, it's going to act like neon. When magnesium loses two, it's going to act like neon. So it has to do with looking at the periodic table and what is its closest noble gas. So these two would go backwards. These would all go forward. Okay, so they all have the same number of electrons as neon. In order to determine the size ranking of isoelectronic ions, it's important to consider the number of electrons and protons in each of them. So you might have to do that. I might say, from this series, which is the largest? The way that you tell has to do, sorry, but did I need, does anybody need that back? Um, no, we're all good? Okay. Um, the way that you tell has to do with the number of protons. 
It's the cheat way of figuring it out. So the more protons an ion has, the smaller the ion gets. Okay? Um, so, I guess I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, you could, the way you check to make sure they're isoelectronic is by checking to make sure the number of electrons is the same. But to know which one is biggest or which one's smallest, you would look at the protons, not the electrons. Okay? So for some, ex like for example, another isoelectronic series would be, like I'm looking around argon. Okay? So um, the cations that would act like argon would be like potassium and calcium. Okay? Uh, and if I went anion, it would be like chloride and sulfide. Okay. What I mean by protons and electrons, how many protons does potassium have? What's its atomic number? 19. Okay, so it has 19 protons, but with the plus charge, how many electrons does it have? It loses one, so it would have 18 electrons. Okay. For calcium, it's one farther, one more than potassium, so it would have 20 protons. But it has a plus 2 charge, so how many electrons? 18. Okay. So do you guys see how the electrons are the same value, and that's why it's, that's why they're called isoelectronic? What's different about them is their proton value. So for chlorine, it would have 17 protons, but with the minus 1 charge, it gains 1, so it would have 18 electrons. And then sulfur has 16 protons and 18 electrons. Okay? So to determine from this set which is the largest or which is the smallest, the more protons, the smaller it is. So you have to think opposite. Okay? So what is the smallest out of this set? Calcium. Yes, calcium is smallest. And what's the largest? The sulfide. The sulfide is the largest. Yeah. So more protons equal smaller, less protons Bigger. Okay, because the less protons you have, the less pull that nucleus has to bring in those extra electrons, so the electrons are able to stay farther away. Thinking about those Columbus forces, right? Um, there's something called shielding that I will learn more about and then teach you about. With all this stuff, it's just different terms, I'm pretty sure. Um, so just to give you an example of what's not isoelectronic, okay, so this is isoelectronic. But let's say, let's see what's not isoelectronic, okay? Um, an example would be if we had sodium atom, or sorry, yeah, sodium atom, magnesium atom, and oxide ion, and fluoride ion. Why are those not isoelectronic? Because only two of them are ions, yes. Currently, these two are isoelectronic because they have charges, and so is this would have six protons. No, that's eight, sorry. My bad. Eight protons and ten electrons. And this would have nine protons and ten electrons. But because the sodium and the magnesium don't have charges, their electrons don't change. So sodium would have eleven protons and eleven electrons. And magnesium would be 12 protons and 12 electrons. So in order for them to be isoelectronic, they have to have charges. Unless it's a noble gas. You could throw in, you could throw in neon, which would be 10 and 10. And then that would make V3 isoelectronic, because the noble gas does have that same as electron. Also, another way that I might try to trick you sometimes to see if something's isoelectronic or not is I might do like a column. Their valence electrons in a column, like in the alkaline earth, the 1As, they all have the same number of valence electrons, but their core electrons are different. And so that's not isoelectronic. Isoelectronic means all number of electrons included have to be the same. Okay, does it make more sense when I read it out like that, what that means? Okay. That's the end of 1.7.